Hello and welcome to episode 9 of Bloggers Are Weird. I'm your host, DJ Paris, of the website ThoughtsFromParis.com. And I first just again want to say thank you for continuing to pass the show along. I got a cat who's uh, meowing in the background there. <laughs> it's, she's not a big fan of the show. But anyway, I appreciate you that are listening. And there's my dog. When you have a moment, if you don't mind passing this over to a friend, family, colleague, HR representative, anyone, and go ahead and let them know that this is the show to listen to. If you like listening to bloggers talk about crazy stuff. And today we actually have a, a quite serious episode. And full disclosure, not a lot of laughs in this one because we deal with a topic that is extremely dark and, and unfortunate, which is called GSA, which is also known as genetic sexual attraction. My guest, Julie Deneen, has been all over the media recently with her new book, Wanted, a Memoir. And since I'm not sure if it's completely clear in the beginning of the interview, she has written a story where she found herself after reuniting with her biological father in somewhat of a romantic relationship with him. And it is an extremely complicated scenario. Uh, Julia is incredibly honest and interesting, and she's a friend. This is just one of my favorite conversations I think I've ever had. So grab a tall boy of Hennessy or whatever your drug of choice is. Mine are the theater-sized boxes of runts, except for those horrible banana ones. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Today's podcast is sponsored by Romance-Text.com. Looking to reignite the passion in your relationship? You have to check out Romance-Text.com. Com. This is how to use text messages to bring back the passion and reignite the spark you once had. Now, if you're thinking this sounds cheesy or maybe it's just learning how to send dirty text messages, it's actually not. This program by relationship expert Michael Fiore has been featured in over 200 television and radio shows. This program has a money-back guarantee. is normally $97, but listeners of Bloggers Are Weird get a special price of only $47 for the entire program. By purchasing the program, you help support this show. Visit romance-text.com and get the passion back. First reunited, I felt like it was such an emotional journey. I wanted to write the story of reconnecting with my birth father, but in a positive way. So I had already started taking notes and kind of going back into my history and then obviously when things fell apart and got really hard, I put the whole thing on the back burner. Um, and when the relationship ended, I began writing again, just kind of as therapy. Um, but eventually realized that there were other people in a similar situation as myself that could probably benefit from hearing my story. Yeah, it was interesting to find out that your first therapist really wasn't versed in genetic sexual disorder. And, no, no. Or I'm sorry, is it is it G, it's GSA? It's genetic attraction. sexual attraction, yeah. Um, although I guess you could probably call it a disorder of sorts, <laughs> but definitely um, dysfunctional. <laughs> definitely, yeah, for sure. For, you know, about as dysfunctional as probably very codependent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was thinking on the way home today that this is a terrible joke, but I thought, well, if you fall in love with your mom, you now have a sequel. So. Oh God, <laughs> that would be so <laughs> awful. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, maybe you have a lovely mother. Who knows? <laughs> but, but I was really taken, and and I, I again, I hope this isn't in any way offensive to you, but how I was taken by how horrified I was, and yet touched at the same time. That it was with every turning of a page, there was a new layer to this onion, and yet it was a very familiar layer, and there was just so much what I perceived in my judgment of manipulation going on. Yeah. Uh, and somebody who was very vulnerable um, and, you know, was and the other thing I thought was really cool was that um, that it seems so recent because you have the you have the timelines right. listed there. Yeah. And it was like, well, this was happening the last two years. Yeah, no, I you know, I knew that if I wrote the story and I gave it distance, it'd probably be a different story. Um, which isn't a bad thing. I know a lot of people need distance before they can write it, but I wanted, I knew that if I wrote it quickly or wrote it right after the events that I would 
it would be more raw, which is essentially what I felt like would connect with other people that are in that situation that they want to, because that was the, the reason was to give people who are in reunions with adoptive parents or birth parents, um, just kind of a touch point. And I had read Catherine Harrison's book, The Kiss, and that was about her reuni- reunion with her birth father. And I remember that was the book that I clung to when I was trying to sort this all out. So I kind of wanted to do a similar thing for others. Oh, by the way, I'm speaking with Julie Deneen, author of Wanted, a memoir, also has the blog a Life According to Julie, which is jdeneen, D-E-N-E-E-N.com. And Julie and I have uh, been colleagues, I suppose, for a while in, in, in the blogging community, and I'm a big, big fan of hers. And uh, I read the book, as I mentioned, the last couple nights, and I just couldn't put it down. And I thought it was interesting because I know that's such a cliche sort of thing to say, yeah. but I, re- I really couldn't put it down because it was, I just, I kept waiting for resolution. Right. And it doesn't really come. Um, although I suppose towards the end there's some things that happen. Um, but tell me a little bit about living through that non-resolution. It's still hard. Um, you know, I'm I'm a lot farther out from it now than when I wrote the book, but that is one of the most difficult parts about this whole uh, reunion gone bad scenario is that I still want resolution. I still want closure. I still want a relationship with the man that I thought he was um, before everything turned sour. And I do still struggle with it um, regularly. So I'm I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm out of the woods in terms of that. Um, And I don't know how long that will take. Yeah. In fact, now that I'm realizing it, there's a lot of people listening that probably have no idea what we're talking about. So this is, we're talking about Julie's book, Wanted. And I think you're going to read from the book today. Is that correct? Yes. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started to give all the listeners an idea of, of what the subject matter we're, we're discussing. Okay, I'm going to just start from the beginning. I'm going to read the first uh, chapter of the book. Go ahead. It was my last day of vacation. Last days are never fun. They carry an urgency to quickly experience all that has been left untouched. The clock in the car blinked 7.25 a.m., Sitting in the front seat next to my father, we drove down the curvy roads to Waimea Bay for our last swim. We chatted lightly about the surfing lesson the previous day. You did really well, Julie. I can't believe you got up on that board so many times. I hope Woody got a picture of you. Woody was a half-baked surf instructor who sat on his board with a camera, snapping photos at tourists, acting like fools. I hope not. I was all hunched over and wobbly. He laughed. Maybe, but it doesn't matter because you are the most gorgeous surfer I have ever seen. The corners of my mouth turned up slightly. Nothing brightened my day more than a compliment from Greg. I lived for these moments. There was nothing I wanted more than to hear him speak affectionately. There wasn't enough time in a day to capture every detail and word from this father of mine who was so new and fresh. I watched his eyes disappear when he smiled, studied the markings along his face. He showed his years of drinking with a bit of a belly and a receding hairline, but continued to surf, ski, and hike like a young kid. I'm sorry we've wasted so many years, he said. I would do anything to get them back. Greg trailed off. I could tell he was feeling remorse for so much lost time, and I didn't want his mood to darken on our last day. It's okay, Dad, really. What's important is that we are together now. I reached out for his arm in reassurance. He put his hand on top of mine. You're right. Together forever, just you and me. I winced briefly but recovered. It wasn't just him and me anymore. Maybe if we'd had the chance to be together when I was two or three or four, there'd be nothing but Dad and Julie to explore the world. Thirty years were gone, and I was no longer a child. He'd made a decision thirty years ago that could not be undone. Relinquishing his parental rights to my mother's new husband, he figured they would do a decent job in raising me. Dad, it's not just you and me anymore. It's your wife, it's my husband, the kids, too. I thought to myself, but I didn't dare speak it out loud because sometimes I wished it were just the two of us. I wanted his undivided attention, but it wasn't real life. I couldn't be the apple of my dad's eye the way I might have been as a small child. We continued to drive in silence, and I counted the number of rusted clunkers along the side of the road. 
Early morning surfers wrestled their long boards off of roof racks, ran barefoot into the waves. How whimsical not to wear shoes, I thought. So much about Oahu represented freedom. Julie, he said. His voice sounded strained. I looked over at him, noticed he was gripping the steering wheel so tightly his knuckles were white. Yes? Well, I have an email I wrote to you a while back. I never sent it because I didn't know if I should or not. It reveals something about me that is very private, and I don't want it to change anything about our relationship. He continued to stare ahead at the road. My mind started to race. As scenario after scenario played in my head, I wondered, did it have to do with his past? Maybe mine? Would he reveal something about why he'd given me up for adoption 30 years ago? I felt the trickle of sweat forming around my forehead. My heart started beating wildly, and I stared down at my hands, picking absentmindedly at the polish on my nails. I wanted that email now. I didn't want to wait for him to push send so I could read it on my computer back at our condo. Eagerness surged through me. Can I see it? I tried to sound nonchalant, but I was anything but. Well, I don't know, he said. It's just a draft on my phone. I knew if I pushed, I could get him to give me his phone right there in the car. I wanted to know what it said immediately. Please, Dad, I promise it won't change what I think about you. His hesitation only ripened my curiosity. All right, but remember, it's only a draft. He took one hand off the wheel, reached into his pocket, and pulled out his Blackberry. Taking his eyes off the road for just a moment, he pulled up the email and handed it to me. I looked at the screen, and I stared in disbelief. The first six words took my breath away. I want to kiss your lips. I couldn't read anything else. I tried to, of course, but every word slipped out of my grasp. Those six words commanded every ounce of attention that I had. I let my hair hang down in front of my burning cheeks, and I panicked. I continued to stare at the screen as if I was reading, but I was buying time. After a few minutes, he spoke. Well, what do you say? He asked tentatively. No, no, this is not okay. I screamed it in my head, but the thought never materialized into the spoken word because of my gut-wrenching fear. Um, wow, Dad, um, let's see, I'm not sure. I'll have to think about it. Maybe later I'll write down my thoughts and I'll respond. Fear crawled up from my stomach and choked away any reasonable confidence or strength. Was that really me talking? I wasn't used to speaking face-to-face -face with Greg. Ever since our reunion, our primary method of communication was through email. I couldn't bear to tell him no, but I knew that I could write it. Well, okay, that's fine. We'll talk about it later. Come on, let's go swimming. In the intensity of the moment, I didn't realize that we had arrived at the beach. Sounds good, I said with a little too much enthusiasm. I kept my eyes low the whole morning, afraid that any prolonged stare might signal that a kiss was welcome. What in the world was I going to do? Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, that is chapter one of Wanted a Memoir, which is available on Amazon. And uh, is it available elsewhere or is that no, the primary I'm place? Just, yeah, it's just on Amazon. And if you look at the reviews, it's almost a perfect five-star review. I read it. I highly recommend it. And it will definitely open your eyes if you're not familiar with GSA and how how it works and I've always heard that women are desperately seeking their father's love and men are desperately seeking their father's approval and your whole book could be a journey to try to to try to obtain his his love and although I guess you always had his love but to try to figure out what that love really what that love really is yeah I mean one of the things that's really difficult and now you know now I I have been um, interviewed numerous times. I went to Madrid this past November and spoke at an adoption conference regarding this phenomenon, is that children especially, when they reunite with their birth parents, they're already coming into the relationship kind of at a disadvantage because they've been rejected once. Even if, even if the birth parent gave up the child for noble reasons, it still feels like an abandonment or rejection because there's this internal uh, belief that you have that says being a daughter wasn't enough. You relinquished me. So when he introduced the idea of being his lover into the equation, there was a part of me that felt very comforted by it because I didn't feel safe as his daughter. 
But I knew if I could capture his attention the way he wanted, which was in a sexual way, then I would have him and then he wouldn't go anywhere. And so that was really comforting and it was very addictive and it was very difficult for me to say, no, this is sick and wrong and twisted and he's manipulating me. And, you know, this is psychological abuse. I couldn't see any of that for a very, very long time. You know, it's funny. Um, I'm sorry. Funny is absolutely not the right word. It is uh, interesting. <laughs> okay. uh, it's funny that I said funny. That was about the only <laughs> thing that's that's chuckling about it. But, w- you know, when I saw Mackenzie Phillips, who talked, uh, which I know is a complete, well, somewhat of a different situation. Yeah. Was that something that you could relate to? Because I know that it was something that when I heard, I was unable to process. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I think I heard it before I reunited. So I remember having a very similar reaction to probably most anybody, which is just being horrified. Um, You know, her situation is different because she grew up with her father. So that's even, that's even more dysfunctional, I think, than what I had to deal with. Um, But absolutely, I I can relate to her now. I, I totally understand how people get wrapped up into situations that they think would never happen to them. And it's really just like a slow fade. It's just one little step at a time until all of a sudden you're like, how the hell did I get here? Sure. It's in some ways it's like an addiction yeah. where it, it, it all happens very incrementally and very slowly. And as you read the book, you really get a sense of that where it's still a little girl trying to get her daddy's attention. And, you know, and his attention is there, but it's very complicated yeah. with his with his own, you know, dysfunction. And now one thing that it didn't really go into, or at least I didn't notice as much in the book, was his own sort of progress with, you know, his feelings. I know he seemed to try to be processing them, but was he getting help at the time or was he kind of on his own? No, he wasn't. And, you know, I still struggle with knowing where in the timeline He went from viewing me as a daughter to uh, a woman that he was wanting to be with sexually. Uh, For a very long time, I thought that it was not there right at the beginning of our reunion because uh, the beginning of our reunion, I mean, if you read it in the book, it's very fairy tale like you know he embraces my family and my husband and it's just this like happy family thing. And so I don't know really where in that, timeline except that I can go all the way back to probably one week into our reunion um, and I can look through some of his emails and I can see traces of um, just the problem starting so he was getting no help he did not go into therapy until I finally severed the relationship in October and and was addicted to alcohol um, through the entire relationship so it did not help matters at all. Yeah, it was pretty obvious. I, I'm somebody who struggled with alcohol addiction in the past, and it seemed pretty obvious, although it wasn't mentioned a whole lot, although you did talk about alcohol uh, for just in certain ways. It seemed pretty obvious to me there was some sort of addiction going on on his end, which um, leads to a lot of, you know, sort of dysfunctional behavior, which obviously manifested in, in this. And then again, I don't know that it was alcohol's fault per se, but it definitely most likely accelerated his own yeah. uh, craziness. I, I do. I think that was it definitely played a role, um, you know, uh, in the relationship. And I think he, you know, I came to find came to find out later that he did have a history of infidelity and cheating on his wife. And, um, you know, he had some past skeletons that pointed nothing that had to do with obviously incest or abuse, but, um, had some past skeletons that made it like, Hmm, that's probably why, you know, you saw this as a prime opportunity. And, and, you know, my, it took a long time for my, my current therapist to help me see that even though this was GSA and it was a different scenario than traditional incest, he was still acting very much like a predator, even if he didn't mean to. And I don't think he meant to, but it doesn't really change the result. No, it doesn't. And it was, I felt very predatory. And, um, you know, this is, uh, it, predators, to my understanding, really prey upon fear. And, you know, the fear of loss of someone's father or the connection there is about as primal of fear as, as for a young woman, as you can imagine. Yeah. So, 
there's really probably nothing scarier than the loss of a, for a young girl, the loss of her father. And you were really a young girl as an adult going through this process, which as an adult was just ultra complicated. Yeah, and it's it's very hard. He still, to this day, does not see me as a victim in any of this, not from 30 years ago and not now. And in, in some ways it's scarier because he has not owned up to the reality of what's happened and, and said, yeah, Julie, you were a victim in this. And yes, Julie, you were at a disadvantage in this relationship because I don't think he sees it that way. Um you know, you could throw around terms like he's a narcissist or he's got, you know, personality disorders. I don't know. Um, but I know that he is a very, very smooth talking, highly successful salesman who has always gotten what he wants. Um, you know, so I don't know. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your, your husband for a moment, if you don't mind. He, I was so impressed and I'm sure you've heard this before in other interviews, but how well he seemed to handle a, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to handle that situation with as much poise and grace and level headedness as he did. Um, yeah. That, I mean, he just wasn't willing to leave. No, and he, you know, from the, from the get go, he, you know, when I was in this like thrill, the honeymoon stage, and I was so excited to reunite with my father and, you know, I was always very honest with Andrew, telling him all the details. And so when things went south, I did tell him, you know, right away. I think I called him about 10 minutes after my father kissed me. And so I think there are three things that kept us together. One, I think the fact that I continued to go to him with it was huge. Um, even if I kept things from him for a couple of weeks, I couldn't last more than probably 14 days before it all just came tumbling out of me. And the second thing is that he knew that there wasn't, that I was looking for my father. He always saw it as kind of a manipulative, abusive situation from the get go. He didn't think of it as a traditional affair. He knew that I was perfectly content in our marriage and our sex life. Everything was going great. So in, I think in some way he probably compartmentalized it a little bit like and split off some of himself just to cope and survive. Um, and I said three things and now I can't remember. But I think those are the two main things that really kept him um, sticking by. Oh, I remember. And I think the third thing is that he was so afraid for me that he was afraid that if he left and I was still in a really vulnerable spot that I would that I would run off with my father and end up in a scenario where he was in jail and I lost my children and you know I think he was afraid for my life quite honestly and well, and, yeah. and you were afraid for his as well he had threatened suicide and, oh yes multiple times yeah um so your husband thank god uh sort of saw the forest through the trees is that yeah, the right expression yes. <laughs> That's about as perfect of a metaphor for that scenario as he truly saw saw the map and and or or saw the territory and not just the map. But um and but I, well, the part I didn't understand is he finally gets to a breaking point yeah. and he's like I'm gonna I'm gonna kill this guy. And well, there's two different breaking points. I guess that was one. And um and I I can't I don't know how he didn't kill him beforehand. That is amazing restraint. Yeah, it was, it, it was, you know, he was doing, he was doing, had to do a dance. There were parts in this relationship where he knew that there was nothing he could threaten me with. I mean, he, I was so lifeless at that point, whether he threatened to leave or take the kids or, I mean, it was like, you can't hurt a dead man. I felt so dead without my father that he could threaten anything he wanted. And that, so I think in that case, he didn't want to make it worse by getting violent with my father. But, you know, towards the end of the book, you see that he does hit a breaking point, as do I, because I, I think at the, I was in therapy at that point, and I was starting to get stronger, number one. I was starting to see things that I hadn't seen before. Um, and I think he knew that if he gave me an ultimatum when I was strong enough to handle it, that I would, that it would snap me out of reality, but it was really a dance. And honestly, I don't know how he did it. The grace of God alone is probably what kept him going because it's, it's nothing short of miraculous. Yeah. 
Now, I don't know if you changed his name, but I'm curious, was there anyone, have you gotten any feedback of people who say, oh, I know this guy? I mean, has anyone sort of identified him as a real person, and has that hurt his, I mean, I, I maybe you don't have any knowledge of that, but has anything come out where it's been as a result of you writing the book, you know, has he been impacted? I don't know. I have, you know, I had one communication moment with him back at Christmas just a couple months ago, a very um, uncomfortable situation. And he, all he alluded to was the fact that he was um, very disappointed, upset, angry, you know, um, told me that I was, you know, that I had committed the worst sin ever by, yeah. um, by uh, publishing the book. But I, to, you know, I don't think anyone in my world knows. I mean, I made very, I was very careful to make sure that nothing on my blog or nothing anywhere linked him to me. Um, even my birth certificate doesn't have his name. So there's really no way to trace who it is unless you know me personally and know him personally and know that we're connected. What about you as well? Has have your friends and and has has any relationships changed for you? Where have you experienced any rejection from people who don't understand what you went through? Yeah, I lost friends because of this. Um, people who couldn't understand how um, I got myself into this situation. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship with somebody who's in an abusive relationship and you just want to rescue them and you can't because they need to see it for themselves. And so I lost a bunch of friends because of that in the midst of it. They weren't willing to walk through it with me. They wanted me to just shape up. And when I couldn't, they, they were gone. Yeah, and it, what's an amazing part of the book for me is how you found support through it. Uh, and I, you, I forgot if you mentioned her name earlier, but another woman who had yes. a very similar experience. Carly, Carly Sullins, yes. She is my... She and I actually run a website, a blog, and an online forum for anybody who is in um, adoptive reunions. And I connected with her um, in May of 2011 um, on an online forum called GeneticSexualAttraction.com, and we became fast friends. We had eerily similar stories, um, and the owner of that site eventually gave us um, the domain, and we've kind of taken over her work together. Yeah. And so I imagine, you know, with the loss of some friends, you have also found a community yeah. that, and you know, community is such an important part of recovery. And, um, let's talk about some of the positive things <laughs> now that has happened. So you, you've been interviewed, you've had some, um, some opportunity to speak out about this, uh, this sort of situation. Yes. And have, have you found, have people reached out to you as a result and, have you found that the community is larger than you would have thought? Uh, yes. I I had no idea how many people go through these um, scenarios. But when you think about the amount of divorce and or sperm donation and, you know, in vitro fertilization, there are a lot of kids running around without their real parents in their life that then grow up and want to find them. Um, I did do uh, two interviews with Dr. Drew. Um uh, we did. We were featured. Carly and I were featured in an ABC News article in May. That kind of exploded and gave us lots of um, publicity for our blog. Which then, in turn, um, you know, I get emails at least once a week, sometimes daily, of people who are in the thick of a reunion and struggling with um, these unnatural feelings and don't know what to do or where to turn. Um, I've had a couple other interviews. I have. Uh, a woman in UK in the UK um taught National Geographic has contacted us we may be doing an interview with them uh Dr. Phil 2020 um we haven't accepted all of the requests for interviews because some of the media wants to glorify this they want to talk about the illicit part of it and living in secrecy and Carly and I are not about promoting that side of it because really truly even those relationships where you know maybe you can find a father and daughter living in secret somewhere with you know children that they've born together the reality is that for 99 percent of people who go through this it ends in complete devastation oh sure and 
Well, let's talk. What are some of the, you know, outside of the community, has there been a tremendous burden lifted from you? Um, obviously, you, you were honest with your husband, which I am absolutely so surprised that you were able to maintain, you know, this honesty when I think it is true we're only as sick as our secrets. Mm. But have you been able to, why writing this book, was it cathartic uh, to get that sort of out of you? Yeah, you know, when you have a really dark secret that you're afraid uh, to tell people, there's always this feeling of, well, they like me now, but if they knew what was behind the curtain, you know, game would be over. So there is something very freeing about telling your worst, darkest secret and then realizing that you're still alive and that people still love you and that life goes on. Um, it's incredibly freeing. And I think for anybody who's, who's been in a situation where, you know, I'm not a traditional incest survivor. I'm not just a victim. So there was part of me that felt like I, even though I felt victimized and I felt abused, I also realized that I had a part to play in this and my own brokenness. And I really wanted to be able to, to speak it out and realize that I'm still okay and people still love me. And it's funny. So many people tell me they're deep dark secrets now like somehow sure. I can handle it because I've gone and told the world my story you know yeah and it, it is it is absolutely the case where it's been my experience that humans want and, and I, this was taught to me by my therapist but it's so true is that the way to intimacy is through sort of revealing mm -hmm. deep dark nasty things and then the other person feels not only close to you but comfortable enough to share their own their own shit. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that that comes, it must come pouring out to you. You know, I bet it comes, um, in, it, do you get a lot of, it, well, you're just saying you get emails, um, mm -hmm. in that capacity. And it's just amazing how people feel like they know you through this book. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's largely, you know, with the exception of some, um, backlash and criticism, which I've had a little bit of the overwhelming, response has been one of support people walk away from the book and the first thing out of their mouths when they talk to me is your husband is incredible and to me um that is really the point of the story ultimately is that my marriage my husband my family is still intact and despite this horrible situation um we're still thriving and that's that is ultimately a happy ending even though it was off awfully Awfully awful in the process. Well, it, it's probably the hap just about the happiest of endings because you, you never, or at least when I was reading it, I never had hope that your father would come around. I just didn't. Mm. He, he seemed like somebody that was unable to get through where he was stuck. But your husband, I was rooting for him the whole time. Yeah. You know, is he, is he going to maintain his commitment? And the fact that he was able to do that was so powerfully uh, exciting that it's 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 sort of the um, the light yeah. to the darkness of the book. Yes, I agree. It's, yeah, and now you get to hear about how wonderful he is for the rest of your I life. I know. Well, I, you know, we joke. I, I I joke, and I actually I think I wrote a blog post just a couple weeks ago about how I'm so tired of the halo around my husband's head because he's just <laughs> like sure. this golden boy, and I'm like, okay, dude. Can you do something sick and twisted, please? You know, and then I'm like, no, never mind, never mind. <laughs> right. Well, I, you know, there was a point where I, uh, you know, because the one thing that we did, we haven't talked about, we don't need to necessarily, but is your husband, I'm sorry, your father's wife yes. and how she was somehow, she got some of the information, but not all of the information and, and, but your husband knew all the information. And so he was in a really unique spot was, you know, do I tell um, your father's wife, you know, certain bits of information and what does she need to know and what, what can she handle? Yeah. And the fact that you were just able to give all the info to him is just absolutely remarkable to me. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine nine out of 10 people wouldn't have done that. They would have kept that secret very close to the past. Well, it was, you know, my husband and I have been together since we were teenagers. Um, I think we started dating when he was still 15 years old. I don't honestly know how to live life without him. And we were friends for many years before we became um, lovers or husband and wife. Um, so it felt it, it was kind of just like, 
you know, in those mo- in those moments where I was really vulnerable and kind of distracted with my father, you know, our marriage was on the rocks, but we, I still depended on him as a friend. And I think that's probably hearkening back to our childhood years. And so it, it, it was like, I didn't, I felt like I didn't have a choice. I, he knew something was wrong, even if I spoke to not spoke nothing. I, it wasn't a secret. I couldn't keep it from him, you know? <laughs> right. I would have well, if you, I could have. <laughs> well, it's it's good that you couldn't have. And I just think with – he was present for pretty much every interaction. You know, physically he was yeah. around. Um, so I imagine it would have been very difficult. But it sounds like your father was able to keep it away from his wife who maybe wasn't as present. I'm not sure how, how involved she was. But um, – you know, it's it's just nice to know that everything is still intact, yeah. that you didn't lose everything as a result of this, you know, confusing time. Yeah, no. And, you know, I think when I I would have moments where I would just feel so helpless in terms of my father's wife. Um, I call her Anna in the book and just feeling like she was living in this other reality and in denial. But then, it, you know, after some internal work, I realized that that's the kind of uh, mindset that she's had to have for her whole marriage and there's some powerful dysfunction at work between those two that allowed what happened to happen between them and that I couldn't fix that no you you can't really yeah. fix any of it I guess other than you know go into your own stuff and uh well let's 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 since I feel like this is the most depressing <laughs> podcast I've ever done uh, let's 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 end it on a positive note sure. because I've known I've known you for a while well before this book started and at, well not so much before that what was going on in the book but certainly before I knew yeah. what the content and I've always found you to be as lovely and happy and cheerful as as can be and let's go ahead and promote your uh, your book and your blog so the book again is Wanted a memoir yeah you can find it on the, go ahead the, the best way to search for it is to search under my name you know go to Amazon and just type in Julie Deneen Wanted if you type in just Wanted you're going to get a million results so Julie Deneen Wanted on Amazon will bring the book up or you can go right to my blog it's right in the sidebar and your blog again is J Deneen which is D-E-N-E-E-N dot com life according to Julie yes. and and it's actually quite upbeat yes and actually you know what my blog most of the time is uh is, uh, you know, I try to be funny and, you know, just kind of look at life from a cartoonish perspective. So, yeah, this book is kind of not my normal gig. And if people want to follow you on Facebook and Twitter, can they do that right from right your from my blog. blog? Yep, that'd be great. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. I appreciate so much of your time and so much of your honesty. It's something that, I mean, my deepest, darkest secrets, I do not share. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And as and as a result, I'm still in therapy. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, I don't really have anything that's that's too crazy. But it, it is this same as you mentioned: is if they only knew, right, right. they would they would run screaming for the hills. <laughs> right. And the reality of it is, uh, they wouldn't. No. And and you know, in your case, a few people did, but maybe they would have anyway down the road without this situation. Yeah. Um, so I so much appreciate you being on the show. Thank um, you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. And so, say goodbye, Julie. (laughs) Goodbye.